can you hear me okay? All right, well, good morning. And, uh, and I wanna thank again the faculty for the opportunity uh, to come here and address your students. Um, it's a real thrill. It's, uh, as many of you spend a lot of time in these kind of auditoriums and these kind of seats, and when you finally get invited to be on this side of the microphone, it kind of tickles you. Um, and, and also in particular, I appreciate the opportunity to come speak at the Naval War College, the oldest of all of the service war colleges, kind of completes my trifecta now since uh, I spoke previously at the Army and the Air War College and now visited the 50th state, Rhode Island, the, the only state I'd never been to before. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to check off some of my uh, personal, personal uh, goals there while we're at this. Um, I want to congratulate all of you on being here. Uh, certainly in my service, it's a highly selective process for deciding who gets to benefit from the advantage of attending a senior service college. Uh, and it's an unparalleled opportunity to take a year away from other kinds of duties, kind of as we say in my service, take a knee, perhaps in yours, you know, some shore duty, some family time, uh, but to really pause, reflect, think, learn and connect. And, you know, in various professional military education opportunities that I have had, there's always the saying, it's only a lot of reading if you do it, and instructors who assign way more reading than you feel like you can do. But I prefer the adage, you get out of things what you put into them. And, uh, and I found that the vast majority of readings I was assigned were worth my time. And I would encourage you to not only do the readings, but to think about them, reflect on them, and most importantly, connect the dots between the things that they are trying to bring out, your instructors are trying to bring out and convey to you. And then uh, finally, I think one of the most important things about a senior service college opportunity is the opportunity to engage with fellow professionals. Uh, you will probably be surprised at how many times your paths are gonna cross. And I know that many of you did PME at, at the field, what we call the field grade level in the Army as 04s or 05s, um, but I found that my senior service college, 06 uh, colleagues that I met in that opportunity, I have had far richer and more frequent interactions with those uh, people than those colleagues and fellow classmates than I did for my, for my previous um, opportunities. So uh, this morning what I'd like to do is discuss the role of strategic intelligence and its impact on decision making, policy making. Um, I think I need to caveat that my experience is predominantly at the combat combatant command, uh, operational theater, CJTF kind of level. Um, I do not have a deep experience in advising the president. I don't have any experience in advising the president. I don't have a deep experience of advising policymakers outside the Department of Defense, but I do have uh, some insight into how that works. I am now assigned to the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, um, where they do, in fact, deliver uh, intelligence daily to various cabinet secretaries, so I can perhaps provide um, some, some insight into that, but my personal expertise and examples will primarily be about serving at the combatant command level or at a CJTF. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm also going to mirror my comments to great extent on uh, comments that I made at the Army War College's strategy forum. They had several days to talk about strategy, and, and specifically I talked about how to be a wise consumer of strategic intelligence. Another thing I really enjoy about these kinds of uh, opportunities is a lot of times intel folks are stuck talking to other intel folks. Uh, I really enjoy talking to operators and those who actually use the intelligence that we produce for their own operations. And I would say the first step in being a wise consumer of strategic intelligence is that you have to have a strategy to begin with. You have to have a framework that that intelligence is going to support. And the way I think of a strategy, and I hope this is not at odds with the instruction that you're receiving here at the War College, is a strategy is when you understand here is where I am or where we are today, and here is where we want to go in the future. This is the environment we have to operate in, the conditions that are gonna affect us, and you develop a plan to get from the current location to a future goal and objective. And that can be you know, a strategy for 
how you intend to transition to retirement or civilian life after the military. It could be your strategy for how you are preparing your family long term for a financial future. It could be a strategy for modernizing the U.S. Navy. It could be a strategy for, you know, how do we change our service to better operate in a digital era. It could be a strategy for defeating the physical caliphate of ISIS. But this is the way things are right now. This is how we need them to look in the future. Know your enemy, know yourself, understand the environment that you have to operate in, what are the various factors that are going to influence that. And then developing what is probably a multifaceted, multi-domain, multiple line of effort plan for getting there. Assigning responsibilities, uh, providing resources, monitor execution, and monitor the environment. And so I think we understand, you know, what that looks like at the theater level. Uh, you know, I've got an air component. I'm going to give them the task, among other things, of conducting a strategic air campaign that is going to degrade ISIS sources of revenue, specifically their ability to extract and profit from uh, oil resources in Syria. I've got another element that's part of my ground component. They are going to have some building partner capacity tasks, working with the Iraqi security forces. And then finally, perhaps, you know, there's some stateside elements that I've given some cyber tasks, a, a separate line of effort, where they are going to prevent ISIS from disseminating their glossy publications, uh, Dabiq and Ramiya magazines, and, and limit their ability to inspire followers around the world. Multiple lines of operation, multifaceted. And I would say when you think about this as a concept for a strategy, uh, again, a plan of getting from one, from where we are to where we need to be, multifaceted, multi-domain, multiple lines of effort. When we think about it at the national level, it's often called a home, whole of government approach. You know, perhaps it is um, the maximum pressure campaign on Iran. And so there are certain tasks that the Department of Treasury has uh, or the Department of Justice for designating organizations for financial sanctions. Foreign service officers in the Department of State are working hard with their counterparts in other nations to bring them on board for our plan for what we intend to do with Iran. And then the Department of Defense that has its own uh, elements that it is executing in terms of that maximum pressure campaign against Iran. Again, the same concept. Um, but I think when we think about uh, strategic intelligence and monitoring that environment that we're going to operate in, it's so much more complex than the kinds of tactical intelligence that at least young army intelligence officers are charged with monitoring, where it really tends to be almost exclusively focused on, unless it's a counterinsurgency, weather and terrain. You know, uh, it's been freezing, uh, we've had freezing temperatures for an extended period of time, that's gonna affect mobility and our ability to uh, cross terrain. We're looking at avenues of approach, key terrain, obstacles, maneuverability and trafficability. When you start talking about strategic intelligence, there's a need to monitor almost everything, you know, demographics, social factors, cultural dynamics, popular sentiment, political developments, new technologies, economic trends. It calls for a much greater breadth of information to meet and monitor, uh, to meet the needs for monitoring these various aspects of the environment. Um, I would say, you know, some of the types of things in monitoring that environment that we need to do at the national level would be things like, you know, China's development of the 5G technology, uh, the rise of populist parties in Europe, and what does that mean for some of our strategies, or, you know, progress that China is making with its One Belt, One Road initiative. Again, monitoring the environment that we are trying to operate in and understanding what impact that is going to have on your strategy. So the first step, just having a strategy to begin with, having a plan, and then clearly communicating that and ensuring that everyone under you understands what we're trying to accomplish. At the national level, you know, when I mentioned the maximum pressure campaign on Iran, this takes the form in, in large part and is led by National Security Council with uh, their various meetings that they have with representatives from different uh, governmental departments. In my experience, again, working primarily at the combatant command and below, for Afghanistan, uh, General Votel, who was my boss at CENTCOM, was very clear. Our job, uh, the Department of State had the lead, Ambassador Khalilzad, we were in support of his efforts. And our role was to create security conditions uh, that would most likely compel the Taliban to come to the table and uh, negotiate with Ambassador Khalilzad and, and his staff. 
our role at uh, CENTCOM, where you had a four-star that is forward fighting the fight in Afghanistan, was to implement aspects of the President's South Asia strategy regarding Pakistan and the Central Asian states so that it would free up the four-star commander in Afghanistan to fight the fight and to create those conditions uh, to get the Taliban to the table. Um, for defeating ISIS in Iraq and Syria, we were given almost incompatible tasks of defeating ISIS on the ground in Syria, which really could not be done without partnering with the heavily Kurdish SDF forces. And to do this while keeping Turkey on side in NATO and not drifting uh, closer to Russia. Very challenging given that the animosity and the deep-seated um, belief of the Kurdish forces as being a threat to Turkey. And then finally, I think I, I've touched uh, briefly on some of the things related to maximum pressure campaign uh, against Iran, which is a part of our national strategy today. So having a strategy, communicating it, and ensuring that all of your subordinate elements and everybody who is part of that effort knows and understands what you're trying to accomplish. And then, as I've mentioned, monitoring the environment. And a key part here, I think, is to ask the right questions. I touched on just a few of the many facets of the environment that you need to monitor at the, at the operational or strategic level. Uh, there's so much information out there. Asking the right questions to help hone the machine, the intelligence enterprise, and narrowing down and providing you the information that's most needed. What can change things for you? Who is adopting the 5G technology? Monitoring Russia and Chinese weapon development. Not just what are they making, who is buying it? How is it being used? Perhaps monitoring the performance of new Russian capabilities in Syria uh, to better understand uh, how those systems perform. Understanding how they're being employed. Monitoring other nations' exercises to understand developments that they're making in terms of joint war fighting capabilities. Looking, for instance, you know, in my CENTCOM hat, watching Pakistan's naval exercises to understand the insights it might provide for us on how they would intend to fight India, uh, potentially, in, in that kind of a, an example. It's about asking the right questions so that your intel team is not spinning their wheels, wasting their time collecting, analyzing, and reporting on things that are not useful to you. And a specific example I'll, I'll give there um, goes back to my experience in Afghanistan. And when I arrived in Afghanistan in the summer of 2012, um, I had this impression, you know how it is when you first show up someplace, you notice things, and then after you've been there 30 days, you're one of those folks, for, like everybody else, for whom everything seems normal and you've stopped questioning uh, why you do things the way they are. But when I first arrived um, at the uh, International Security Assistance Force, the four-star headquarters in Afghanistan, I had this impression of this giant machine. We were counting a lot of stuff. We had an army of ORSAs, Operation Research Systems Analysis folks, and they had a, a whole platoon of them down at the three-star headquarters as well. In particular, we were counting violence stacks, roadside IEDs, heat maps by time, by district, by region, trying to correlate it with our own activities. And I was, I, that was among many things that we were counting, and it, it just seemed like this big, I imagine this big Willy Wonka machine with all these knobs and dials, and if we could get them all adjusted just right in some combination of electrical power generation and girls in school and minimizing IEDs and businesses that are open here, if we get them all lined up just right, instead of spitting out a candy bar, this big machine was gonna spit out victory and we could all go home. That's the way it felt. And, uh, but you know, you're there 30 days, you stop asking questions, you just keep producing your little heat maps about IEDs and where they're going off. And then General Dunford came in, and I'm a huge fan, just a brilliant commander. Uh, and he said, I was running the JIOC, the the Joint Intel Operations Center at the four-star headquarters, and he said, I don't care about that. He said, let the three-star headquarters worry about that. I want you to tell me about the confidence of the Afghan people in their government. And I went, that's really hard. I don't have any sensors for that, not something I can fly ISR and collect, but it was the right question to ask. It was the right strategic question. And he was reorienting our staff at the four-star headquarters to focus on the strategic questions and the things that he needed to engage on. And again, let the three-star headquarters worry about that tactical stuff, about where the IEDs are going off, what the violence looks like. They're the ones that are working with the Afghan National Security Forces. I'm focused on the big strategic picture. So 
asking the right questions. Another thing that General Dunford did that I really appreciate and valued is he opened the door, he opened the aperture to his thinking. So before him, you know, oops, sorry, the commander would, uh, you know, meet in his office with the door shut with the two and the three, probably the five sometimes, and then they'd come out and give guidance. General Dunford opened the door a little more, and, you know, it wasn't like this, but, you know, there might be 12, 15 people. You could backbench if you were a, an 06 in a key position, and to sit and hear the commander think out loud and talk about what was on his mind and share his experiences was tremendously valuable as the intel team to help us in collecting the right information and produce the products that he needed because we were gaining insight into what was important to him. And so, you know, we come, call it the commander's PIR, priority information requirements, intelligence requirements. They're typically drafted by the two and the three, but they are the commander's questions. And if you don't understand the commander's strategy and what he's thinking about and what's important to him, then you're not going to be able to produce the strategic intelligence products that are most needed. He really has to allow you to get inside his head, um, to understand what he's trying to achieve, what decisions and actions he might take so that you can identify for him risks to his campaign or opportunities that he can take advantage of. Um, uh, General Votel was another commander I worked for who was fantastic in this regard. And so, you know, as you're monitoring the environment, you can identify, ooh, Kurdish separatist campaign. This is a risk. This is a potential risk to our campaign and something that I need to bring to the boss's attention. Or, ah, you know, I need to tell General Townsend about how things are unfolding with the Iranian-aligned militia groups, the Hashal Shabi in, uh, in Iraq. If you're not inside his head and don't understand the actions he might take or the decisions he's considering, then, then you will only be reactive and will not be able to proactively arm him or her for action. And so I think the best intelligence products derive, drive some kind of action. And by action, you know, in my experience, again, working for these commanders, it could be, hey, I need to incorporate X, Y, Z in my talking points with General Bajwa. Or that development with the Hashtal Shabi is concerned to me. I need to make an office call and, and pay a visit to the prime minister. Maybe I need to alert the Secretary of Defense. Maybe I need to ask the chairman to call his counterpart, General Gerasimov, in Russia. Maybe I need to reposition forces, reconsider my scheme of maneuver. The action on the part of the commander might be, look like not inaction. It might be, you've confirmed that my scheme of maneuver is the appropriate one, and I'm going to stick with it. Um, it may be uh, directing the J-5 to stand up some kind of operational planning team, or the J-3. So some kind of action. And, and, and I'd been asked by the, the faculty to please elevate some of my examples and, and not speak strictly about um, about combatant commands or, or CJTFs, I would say, at the national level, some of these actions might be, you know, I'm going to I'm going to launch Secretary Pompeo around the world, and he's going to start uh, talking about why we need to put additional sanctions on Iran. Uh, an action might be, you know, I'm going to the NATO summit, and these are some things I'm going to need to talk about in terms of what our uh, partner nations are doing in their own defense spending. Might be calling President Erdogan in Turkey to talk about his intent to purchase the S-400 weapon system from Russia. Might be about designating a various group or an actor as a terrorist organization. The best intelligence is going to drive some kind of action or activity. And there's just so much information that's out there. Um, the ability of the intelligence team to screen all of that information and package it in a usable way uh, that is relevant to that leader is very difficult if you don't understand, if you're not in their head, if you don't understand what they're trying to accomplish and what kinds of opportunities are available for them to take action. So for this to happen, and I've described, you know, General Dunford or General Votel or General Townsend, and I'm sorry, I, I don't have a lot of naval examples, although General Dunford, I guess, is technically a member of the sea services. Uh, was um, that you ha the intel team has to be trusted member of that inner circle. And so, in particular, those who are interacting with the commander, not only does the intelligence have to be a quality uh, that someone wants to read and digest, but whoever is delivering that to the commander, there has to be a degree of rapport. 
it has to be a very personal uh, relationship. And when I worked for Lieutenant General Townsend, now General Townsend, the AFRICOM commander, I worked for him in Iraq and Syria for Operation Inherent Resolve, he always said the most important personal relationship that he had after his XO was the relationship with the two. Because when you come and tell him about a threat, or when you warn him about a risk to the campaign, or you're advising him of a potential opportunity, if there isn't a level of trust and rapport, he's not going to consider that or act on that. And more than any of the rest of his staff, that was one that when you look him in the eye, there has to be a degree of trust in what you are, are telling him. Um, it's very, you know, we had to work kind of finesse sometimes at U.S. Central Command on folks who would interact with key, key senior leaders in delivering their intelligence each day. If you have an analyst that, you know, you sense they're shaky or maybe the boss, you know, doesn't trust them or question them, you got you to swap them out because there has to be this level of rapport. Um, and I think that many of the comments that I'm making about strategic intelligence, you could also say, pertain to the rest of the staff. You know, you've also got to trust the three, you've got to trust the five. Uh, and the same comments about opening the aperture and expanding your inner circle to ensure that key members of your staff understand what you're trying to accomplish is certainly not unique to the intelligence warfighting function. It also pertains to your ops and your planners as well. Um, understanding how your boss receives information. You know, uh, General Allen, uh, another member of the sea services. Uh, when, he, when he received information in Afghanistan, uh, he was one of the commanders for whom I worked, uh, he, he wanted to get his read book first thing in the morning and he would read it alone in his room with his coffee. Uh, some of your commanders will write in the margins and, and return it with questions. I love that, I love the interaction. Uh, some are gonna, you know, General Votel, we deliver the book and you kind of sat and watched him read it in silence. That was a little awkward. Um, but uh, but um, he is, he is a, a brilliant man and you just kind of adjust to them over time. General Townsend, uh, very extroverted. There was nothing he liked more than sitting in our tiny little plywood skiff uh, with an analyst on either side of him and a map in the middle and, and having a dialogue with them about, you know, whatever condition of the battlefield we were gonna discuss that day. Um, so understanding how your commander likes to receive information. Uh, are they a graphic person? Do they want to read in silence? You know, do they want long literature? And, and in particular, one of the challenges, and now I digress a little bit, I think that uh, we sometimes face in the intel community is, uh, you know all this stuff, winnowing it down to just those key nuggets to tell the commander exactly what he needs, not leaving anything out, but not having anything extra. There's an expression I love, I think it's Mark Twain, um, I would have written you a shorter letter if I'd had more time. Uh, it takes a lot of work to distill things down to those essential nuggets, and you really can't do it if you don't understand you know, what he or she is trying to accomplish so that you can distill it down into something really concise. I used to tell folks, I would love to put you in the boss's shoes for one day and have you see how much information he is expected to consume and digest. And if you did that for a day, you'd understand why this three-page, single-space Word document is just not going to cut it. Um, you've got to distill it down into something that is really useful, uh, usable and, and concise. So to kind of recap where we're at, I talked about having a sound strategy, communicating it to your team, monitoring the environment by asking the right questions, including key leaders in your inner circle so that they can help and scan the horizon and the environment and identify what you need to know. Um, and then establishing that degree of trust, rapport uh, with a credible intelligence leader who can manipulate the intelligence enterprise to get you what you need. I think the next step uh, as a leader and consumer of strategic intelligence is you need to demand quality intelligence and, and, and provide feedback. And you know, I've, I've talked about, I love it when a boss says, this graph is too busy. Well, I'd prefer to have it be just right, but I mean, I, I, I appreciate the feedback, this graph is too busy. You know, so-and-so doesn't want to read. He wants you to tell him about it. Um, one that you must insist on is do not accept raw traffic. Do not accept people just shoving intel reports in front of your face. And this happens in DC all the time, and it drives me nuts. Um, it's got to come with context. What does it mean? What are we doing about it? I'll give you an example. I'll try to do this without making it, you know, you could trace back and attribute it to someone. This was in D.C. I, I heard they were, they were prepping someone to go across the street and across the river and talk to 
the president. It was in May. Tensions are rising with Iran. And they're going around the, the table and, and, you know, what do you got, what do you got, what do you got? And this guy says, we have a threat report. That's a problem right there, a threat report. We have a threat report that Iran is uh, looking at pulling operatives from Lebanon and uh, sending them to Diyala and waste provinces in Iraq to kidnap American service members. And then they go on to the next person. I, want, I was back I wanted to pull my hair out. One, I would never present a single unattributed threat report, uh, unevaluated threat report. I wouldn't even give that to the commander in Baghdad. You know, I'd want to know, does the RSO at the embassy think it's real? You know, is this a credible source? Have we heard from them before? Is this feasible? What I'm thinking is, you know, why would, why would Iran take uh, operatives from Lebanon when there are Iranian-aligned Shia militia groups ready to do us harm right now in Baghdad? I don't need to move people from Lebanon to uh, other provinces to execute what's probably a pretty complex operation, a kidnapping, figure out where the Americans are, how they drive to work every day, that's not imminent. And then the last thing, you know, we haven't been in Wasted or Diyala provinces since 2011. So I would totally disregard this kind of threat report, but I hear it happen all the time. People just shove these reports uh, in front of seniors in DC. I've thought about you know, what makes this happen. Uh, just a couple more examples. Um, when I was at CENTCOM, I could not control what the CIA provided to General Votel. I could, I could control what any of the other agencies gave him, but CIA had you know, their own link with him. And, uh, and they would come brief me on these highly compartmented reports uh, that they were going to give General Votel, typically on the Taliban. And are they going to reconcile or not? And every other report would contradict each other. I can't keep straight the names of all these different Taliban leaders, my eyes are rolling back in the back of my head, and I said, oh my god, why do you subject me to this? Why do I have to look at this? All I want to do is just give it to an analyst, an expert, have him look at it and tell me what it means. And they said, well, we're giving it to you because this afternoon we're going to give it to General Votel. I said, oh, why, why are you going to give this to General Votel? Well, we give it to General Votel because we're going to give it to the secretary. <sighs> why do you give it to the secretary? Because there are senior leaders out there that think it's really hot and sexy to like read the latest intel reports. And, uh, and it is not. Uh, just like this one, the example I gave you about, um, you know, they gave a senior this crappy, unevaluated threat report. Um, well, where's the context in this other stuff? And the genie's out of the box. It's really hard to get back in. Um, uh, there's, I used to get the electronic read book of a deputy assistant secretary at the Pentagon, and it was full of just human reports. And, and I think as the intel community, your intel community, if they're doing this for you, is abdicating their responsibility to do analysis and tell you what it means. Um, uh, and why we would force a deputy assistant secretary to figure out what these various human reports mean and whether they can be corroborated through imagery or consistent with what we've seen before or totally implausible, that's our job. So um, I think part of the problem is everyone wants to be in the know and they fear not having seen something that others have seen. And so, you know, we also had a special stream of highly compartmented SIGINT that we would get, say, on countries like Iran. And, uh, and I remember looking at one one time at CENTCOM, and, and we found it highly implausible and decided not to give it to the boss. I think General Votel was on travel, so it was really the DCOM. And, uh, but a subordinate commander, his staff's feeding him all this stuff, and he calls up, he's like, hey, it's kind of who's got a secret, hey, you see this, you know? DCOM turns and looks at me, Gibson, <laughs> why are you holding out on me? Well, because I didn't believe it. So it's sometimes kind of a, a tricky thing, and I've, I've advised uh, when subordinate twos would ask me, hey, I got this threat report, I don't believe it, do you think I should share the boss, share it with the boss? And I typically say, if you think some other senior leader is going to table drop it somewhere, then you might let him know. I've seen this, I don't believe it, here's why we're not going to pursue it, or I'm talking to the RSO, or these are the steps we're taking. But there's this kind of, I think, this sort of climate or culture of people are afraid that somebody else has seen stuff they haven't seen, and so they demand or insist this raw traffic. Do not accept it. Uh, um, it is, it is your, your intel team, you're letting them off the hook if you're allowing them to just give you raw traffic. And the last example I'll give in this regard, this is also in DC. Um, you know, again, tensions heating up with Iran. It was probably September. And, and one of the people that goes across the river to deliver the PDB to cabinet secretary said, oh, Secretary Pompeo said he's so sick of all these threat reports. Why do you keep giving me these threat reports and nothing ever happens? And I said, well, why do we give him all these threat reports? I mean, you know, 
Uh, I think that there is also sometimes on the part of certain entities uh, a fear that if something happens and I didn't tell you about it, I'm going to be on the hook. So there's a little bit of a CYA there. But, um, but your Intel team is not doing their job if they're just giving you raw stuff or they're giving you stuff that's not relevant, they're just giving you material that lacks any kind of analytic content. So insist on it. I think the second thing I would say in terms of, of having that interaction with uh, those who provide intelligence is to engage in dialogue. Uh, this enables them to identify risks and opportunities. Um, uh, and, um, and, and analysts enjoy that. Uh, they like, they appreciate the feedback. We were talking at breakfast this morning about a four-star that a couple of us have, who have worked for before that was like a cipher, like a statue, like, you know, he provided no feedback when you briefed him, and you don't know. And he was also not someone who opened the aperture very big either. He was someone who went in the door with two or th you know, behind the closed door with two or three people and then kind of came out and there was guidance. So you never knew if you were hitting the mark or not. Is this right? Um, engage in dialogue. Analysts really appreciate that. And, and if you ever disagree, challenge them. Um, uh, you know, I had some very cynical Pakistani analysts uh, in Tampa, and periodically General Votel would say, you know, what you're briefing me is not what I'm observing when I go there. Uh, when I was in Afghanistan, our, our DCOM was uh, General Sir Mick Carter, the, I think he's the Chief of Defense Forces in the UK now, and he would be like, you know, that is not consistent with what I observe when I, you know, meet with senior leaders here in Kabul. So challenge your analysts. Um, uh, but you have to be careful to do it in a way that, like any other staff, that it doesn't shut them down and stop them from pre presenting you material. And they've got to learn to grow a skin and, you know, wear a little Kevlar under their uniform. But um, uh, engage in dialogue and challenge them, uh, push back when you think it's appropriate. <clears throat> the third thing I think I'd say is you must demand diverse products and viewpoints. So it is important to hear multiple voices. And again, these things I'm talking about regarding strategic intelligence, I'd say they pertain to so many other facets of senior level decision making. It's important to hear multiple voices. Sometimes there is a resistance in certain commands or communities or elements that, you know, it has to have our unit or agency logo on it. Um, I, I think that would be a bad idea. I think you should be receiving information from a variety of viewpoints. And if somebody else puts something out that I agree with, that's one less paper I have to produce, and I'm going to put that in the boss's book. Um, I think it's important also to accept allied products. You know, we have allied partners who have capabilities very similar to ours, and in some cases uh, have much greater access uh, than we do. I was just talking to one of your classmates here, uh, Jane Stokes, who I worked with at CENTCOM, about the value that we put on information we got from Jordan. You know, tiny little country, doesn't have a navy, really. Um, but, uh, but they have valuable human insights and tribal understanding of things that happen in southern Syria that we will never figure out. So talking to allied partners and accepting their information and material in your books. Um, I think the specific example uh, I'll give on that case is, is, is a Syrian example. Um, after a while, after we liberated Raqqa and Manbij and, and some of the key cities in northern Syria, and uh, the predominantly Kurdish, but it was a Kurdish Arab force, um, there would be reports, uh, we would hear that there were issues with the local Arabs. But yet when you would go back to the guys on the ground and ask, they'd say, no, there's nothing to see here. Uh, we would go into villages to investigate this and meet with Arabs that would tell us, no, there's nothing going on here. Um, and the own reporting that was coming up from our human channels said, there's nothing going on here. But I started to think about it, and I realized that all of our human sources, as well as the Arabs that we were meeting with, were really provided to us by Kurds. And even the Arabs we were meeting with were Arabs that were introduced to us by Kurds. And I thought, I'm not sure we're getting the full objective picture of what's happening here. So I went to the CIA, and I said, you know, here's what I think I'm observing that's happening with military reporting in Syria, you know, what do you got? And their networks were much the same, either coming from Kurds or from sources that had been introduced to them by Kurds, and really a lot of the same Kurds. So I went to the French, 
And I said, you know, I know that you are operating independently here, and you have completely different sources than we do. I am really interested in your assessment of the Kurdish Arab dynamics in northern Syria. And they were fantastic. Uh, they produced a product for me, got it translated into English uh, in, in probably about eight days. And it was, I felt more objective and a little different than anything that was available in American reporting. And I gave it to General Votel and I said, sir, because we had concerns about this, I, th I think you need to read this. So accept reporting, insist on products and viewpoints from all over. You need to be exposed to multiple viewpoints. Your own analysts run into their own biases, especially if they've been looking at things for a really long time. And then finally, I'd say accepting unclassified reporting. Um, there's such a wealth of information that's available unclassified now, um, but sometimes intel teams or agencies will resist uh, providing classified information, and I think you need to be very receptive to that as well. So the fourth point I think I would make after, you know, the way that you demand quality intelligence, don't accept raw traffic without an analysis, engage in dialogue and demand diverse products and viewpoints. The fourth point would be thinking about how you receive intelligence or information writ large, particularly when it's bad news or you don't agree with it. Um, you know, we all have heard, don't shoot the messenger, and again, this is another one that pertains not only to intelligence but, but to other things. You know, when you shoot the messenger, when you are extremely volatile, uh, when you receive information that you don't like, um, over time, your staff will be reluctant to present that information to you, even when it's the truth. Uh, and again, this will pertain, you know, operations, logistics, intelligence. So. Um, your demeanor and, and the manner in which you receive information uh, that, that you don't like or isn't what you want to hear is really important. Still challenging it when appropriate, but challenging it in a way that doesn't shut down the team. And with General Votel, I would know that I was presenting information that he really didn't want to hear because um, as I finished, he would just kind of look at me and say, thanks. And then he'd turn to someone else, and I'd think, okay, it's, you know, he didn't really want to hear that, but he accepted it, and it never shut me down or present, prevented me from presenting other information to him that he might not like. And you really have to beware what we call politicization of intelligence. Um, be vigilant. It's rarely blatant, in my experience, in the military, um, but it can, it, it, it can be sneaky and insidious and works its way in uh, in part, people who want to please the boss, people who want to give the boss good news. Again, that gets back to how you receive information that, that you don't like. Um, at what, right before I actually it was two J2s, before I got to CENTCOM, but they were still working through this when I got there, um, there was an allegation uh, to the Department of Defense IG that the CENTCOM staff was doctoring intel. Uh, it was in the early phase of the fight against ISIS that uh, analysts would produce things that told about ISIS victories and that someone somewhere in the high levels was, was changing adjectives or adverbs, making things sound less bad than they really were. There was a big investigation. It was not founded. They found other problems, but they did not find that they were fixing intel. Um, but there was a belief on the part of some of the analysts that what I'm submitting what I believe to be true is being changed by someone in the command, and that is very, very dangerous. Um, the intelligence community has analytic tradecraft standards and, and training to prevent that, um, but commanders also play a role. And again, it, I think it often gets back to how you receive information. I have seen uh, commanders at subordinate elements who tried to suppress reporting that was coming out of their area. Uh, perhaps they didn't like the way it was being said, who tried to stop Human reports from leaving. Whenever you know the hair would go up on my neck, and I would either call them directly or their two to talk about. You cannot. This is very dangerous. You cannot. Even if you don't like what it says, you have got to let these kinds of reports um, out out into the open. And I don't know if this class has um, or is reviewing as part of the curriculum <clears throat> the Afghan papers, the secret history of the war, the whole you know series of articles that came out in the Washington Post in December that kind of. Uh, accused, uh, perhaps rightly, uh, folks of, of, of between the news on the street and by the time it would hit the press in the United States, taking on a, a much rosier view uh, sometimes of the way things that were going in Afghanistan. I, I think we all bear a responsibility for ensuring that it is the truth uh, that we're conveying. And again, commanders can, can play a role in promoting 
uh, honest, candid, objective feedback or um, by shooting the messenger or reacting negatively um, inadvertently color the kinds of reporting that happens, and that's not good for anybody. I think the most extreme example of politicization of intelligence would be actual omission or cutting. And sometimes we see, you know, people choose not to forward information because it's bad news. And the only specific example I can give, there was, you know, you could Google it, there was a member of, I think it was Department of State, INR, who uh, resigned because his papers on climate change or the information he wanted to include on climate change were excised. Uh, or were not allowed to be included. That would be an example, I think, of omission, of politicization of uh, intelligence that results in omission. Um, always tell the truth is a mantra that my early bosses instilled in me. I once worked as a young captain for the director of uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency, Lieutenant General Patrick Hughes, and I remember DIA, this was in the 90s, DIA had, um, had just released a report that said, that concluded that Cuba is not planning to invade the United States or something along those lines. And he was summoned to the Hill to go explain to various members of the Florida delegation uh, how could the intelligence community possibly come up with this. Uh, that was my first exposure to anyone trying to politicize intelligence and he said, always tell the truth. I think another aspect of this to think about as a consumer or commander is you have to be careful and this, is, this can be hard to do, um, but you can't view the intelligence as your report card. Uh, of how well you are doing or not. And I think this is part of the challenge that we sometimes ran into, particularly in Afghanistan, uh, is commanders who viewed negative reporting about, you know, Afghan National Security Forces still don't have their stuff together. Taliban still controlling all this number of districts. Is people, commanders, twos, operators who were viewing that as their report card and, and fighting back against it. So before I deployed to Afghanistan, I did what's very typical in intel circles, and I kind of did the rounds of all the agencies in DC and on the eastern seaboard before I went forward. And, and, and as I went, there was huge disparities in how people were seeing the war. General Petraeus uh, just left theater. Um, you may or may not be aware he had issued a, a it was, I think, an unprecedented dissent uh, by a commander of a CIA annual assessment called the National Intelligence Estimate. It, it, it actually, I guess it wasn't technically CIA, but CIA had a big hand in it, of, uh, uh, of how the war was going and, and to have the commander on the ground publish this very lengthy dissent. And so there was a lot of ill will between the CIA and the Department of Defense in terms of their views. And, and before I went out there, I'm doing the rounds and people would, you know, unprompted say, you're gonna hear a spectrum of views. Here's where we stand on this end. And, and, in, and as I categorized them, the CIA and the National Ground Intelligence Center were doom and gloom. It's disastrous. It's all going to fail. And a little disturbingly, the folks in Tampa, we had the AFPAC Center, as well as the folks forward in theater, is all sunshine and light. It's all really good. They just don't understand. Um, and the, the people who were doom and gloom would say, you know, those guys forward in theater and down in Tampa, they're too close to the problem. They're emotionally attached to success, and they don't see the forest for the trees. Um, and then the sunshine and light folks would say, you know, those people at the CIA, they don't understand. They don't have any operational context. They haven't been forward. They're just looking at reports. They, of course, violence is up in that district. It's up because we're operating off the FOB. If we went back to the FOB, there would be no violence. They don't understand the, the operational context, and, uh, and they're just looking for negative stories. And the scary thing is, they're all looking at exactly the same data. We would often have these, okay, what do you have that we don't have? What do they have that you don't have? They're all looking at exactly the same data. And frankly, it reminds me very much of politics in this country sometimes. All looking at the same data and seeing it entirely differently. And this is part of why it's so important as a commander and a consumer of intelligence products to insist on products from multiple viewpoints. Um, Interestingly, then I got forward to theater and I saw that same dynamic playing out in micro level. Uh, I'd be sitting in you know, my office at the Four Star headquarters listening to Army captains uh, on, a tan on, a, on a VTC talk about how great their Afghans were doing out in you know, RC South or East or wherever. And, uh, and, and if I didn't know better, uh, if you just tuned out the words and listened to the tone, it was like, this is an Army analogy, I'm sorry, company commanders at a quarterly training brief, you know talking about all the great things that their company has accomplished in the last 90 days. Uh, just very raw, raw, always looking for the positive. And whenever my team would put out a negative report, 
uh, about the Afghan National Security Forces, I'd get a nasty call from General Nakasone, who was uh, General Milley's two, uh, two, and saying, you don't understand the context. You're too removed, even though we're three miles apart. You're too removed. Uh, you know, y you don't understand, you know, what's really going on out there. So people become emotionally wedded, or they do, I think, lose objectivity sometimes. And so, again, it's very important to, uh, to insist on multiple viewpoints. And then the final point I'd make in that regard is keeping an open mind. You yourself have to keep an open mind. You have to be aware of confirmation bias on your own part, on the part of your staff. What is it you want to see? Because that data that I talked about in Afghanistan, we all had the same data. And you could bend, you could use that data to support almost any argument about where you thought things were headed. So beware of confirmation bias on, on your own or the part of your staff. Retain the ability to see things differently. You know, when you've got this strategy of here's where I am, here's where I want to be, of course that's what you want to have happen, but don't be so vested in that vision that you're unable to recognize when things are going in a different direction. And sometimes it's in a positive way and something that you might fail to take advantage of an opportunity because you're so vested in this vision. You have to retain an ability to see that things are changing, to accept the left hook, um, and that's part of why you need those diverse views. I think, um, you know, before we kind of open up for questions, one of the things I want to do is, is talk a little bit about uh, a, a reading, you know, back to my initial points of, I hope you do the readings, um, uh, a reading that I think you guys got from uh, Dr. Jarvis on why intelligence and policymakers clash, and, and just a couple of things that I, I want to maybe hit, you know, out of that article. Uh, and one of them is, you know, the expectations of policymakers and decision makers, which, you know, as a member of the intelligence community, I think are sometimes unreasonable. Hollywood doesn't do us any favors. Uh, you know, enemy of the state, 24 homeland, you know, it's just, I, oh, James Bond. I mean, I love those movies, but you walk in and they go, what is so-and-so doing? I don't know, let's see. And they can pull up, you know, it just doesn't work that way. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember many exercises getting beat up by the three or the commander about, you know, where are the enemy forces? And I'd be like, How, you know, you got Blue Force Tracker and you don't know where all our guys are, but I'm expected to have this perfect knowledge of where the enemy is. Or, you know, here's another real example. I remember summer of 13, we're briefing on elections in Afghanistan, and General Milley, who was a three-star at the time, just bullying me, you know, saying, God damn it, you know, tell me who's going to win the Afghan elections. And I thought, we never know who's going to win ours. Um, but yet, you know, I'm expected to tell you, before we even know who all the candidates are, who's going to win the Afghan election. So some of it, defensively, is, is a little bit of unrealistic expectations. Um, but I think, you know, part of that has its origin in our own success and in Hollywood uh, and in the American way of war, which demands precision, lethality, minimal casualties, and we spend a lot of money on technology, and we expect to get a return on that investment. And the way that we wage war, and to use, again, another example from my experience, uh, the April 18 uh, strikes on Assad's chemical infrastructure in Syria, you know, which was fantastic. And we had, uh, you know, weapons launched, seaborne, airborne weapons, U.S., U.K., France, from the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, and the Gulf simultaneously, you know, come, launching hours apart sometimes the munitions. It depends on, you know, the speed at which they travel and where they're coming from. All impacting within five minutes to utterly destroy two facilities. That requires a lot of precision. That is incredibly expensive. Now, if we want to wage war like the Syrians, and we just want to devastate Aleppo or Damascus or Ghouta, that doesn't take a lot of intel. You just drop a lot of barrel bombs. Um, so the American way of war demands precision, and our commanders expect precision, and I think this contributes to it. Um, uh, and then, you know, this expectation uh, that the intelligence community is always going to deliver. And I think the intelligence community can only deliver like that in places that we are already looking at. So another reason that you gotta be in the commander's head and understand what's possible, what those opportunities are, because we do have finite resources and where are we gonna focus them? And if you have the opportunity, you know, potentially to rescue Caitlin Coleman and her Canadian husband who've been held by the Haqqani militants in Pakistan for a couple of years and maybe in the next 72 hours we're gonna launch national mission forces to go rescue them, that's not the time to say to the boss, I don't know anything about Pakistani air defense. You have to be looking at it in advance, and you can't look at it in advance and understand what the commander might need if you're not in his head and you don't understand the strategy or the range of options that are available to them. Um, so, 
uh, again, these sometimes unreasonable expectations for precision and perfection in every regard. One of the biggest challenges that I've had uh, as an Intel professional, and it was actually the mantra that we adopted at CENTCOM for our current Intel division, is to be the first with the truth. And it's a real struggle to be, I'm sure newspapers face the same thing. You know, I got this piece of information, I could drop it now, but maybe it's not accurate. And you do that too often, and you lose your credibility. But if you wait to double check, triple check, quadruple check, make sure you're absolutely right on this, and then go tell the boss, well, now it's too late, and he's heard it from a bunch of other people already. So being first with the truth is a very tricky part of, uh, I think, of, of being successful in uh, the American intelligence community. You can't let others beat you, but you gotta be right. Um, and so uh, this is another part, I think, of the expectation of our intelligence community. I think also, and you'll get this from the article, you know, those policymakers or others who are inclined to resist information that a policy is failing. Uh, perhaps that's been at the root of some of the challenges that we've had in Afghanistan. And I think we have to think about, as intelligence producers and as those who are delivering intelligence to, to key leaders, you know, how often does the boss need bad news? Uh, because if you keep telling him every week, the Taliban are winning, the Taliban are, or, you know, they, they own these districts, they own the, you know, they're going to start tuning you out. You kind of, you, you risk becoming either the boy who cried wolf or, you know, I'm so sick of hearing this negative news from you that they're going to shut you down. And so when we think about how often do you need to reinforce bad news, I, I think we need to ask ourselves, is this going to inform a decision or action? And I've given some descriptions of some of the types of things that in my mind are action. I'm going to launch the Secretary of State. I'm going to call President Erdogan. I'm going to make a press announcement. I'm going to, you know, enact sanctions on someone. If it's not tied to an action or decision, then maybe I don't have to rush every repetitive piece of bad news to the boss or something that, that they might resist. These are, again, part of, I think, what, why we call it the art of intelligence and, and having to have that close, personal, <coughs> trusted relationship with the person that you're informing. And then I think, you know, we have to recognize that a commander, policymaker, a decision maker is going to make a call at the end of the day that is not based solely on intelligence, usually. You know, it's, it is in many cases going to be, particularly in the military, based on gut and intuition and experience. And intelligence is one of the many things that informs them. And sometimes I think the intelligence community can get wrapped around the axle thinking they got to be exactly right, they got to quaffle or, or, or qualify uh, everything. And, you know, I grew up in a community where uh, the commander turns to you in the tent and says, Deuce, what do you think? And you better tell him. Well, it could be this, but here's what my money's on X. You know, he doesn't want to hear this 80%, 70%, 65% kind of stuff that you sometimes get in intelligence uh, products if you look back in the uh, footnotes. Um, and then I think finally another key thing that is highlighted in this article is it can be hard to change people's minds on central issues, uh, you know, so whether it's to do with Taliban reconciliation, whether it has to do with, you know, uh, Iran's or China's place in the world, there are certain key beliefs uh, that you just are not going to change uh, a leader or a commander's um, decision criteria or, you know, the way they believe about something. Um, I have a lot of other things I could talk about, but I don't want to dominate this conversation. Um, uh, perhaps we'll weave some of that into the Q&A. I did ask the instructors, uh, I said, you know, is this going to be a shy and reticent reserved group that is reluctant to, to uh, talk about anything, or are they going to be provocative and engaging? And I'm certainly hoping, just like uh, a commander that I might provide intelligence information to, I'm hoping uh, that this is a provocative and engaging group, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks. Thanks.